can we know? Can we actually know if we're going to be in the kingdom or not? I won't actually ask you to do this, but I, 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 just imagine I asked everyone here to put your hand up if you felt confident that you were going to be in the kingdom. I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're a similar sort of ecclesia to my own at Gosford that there probably wouldn't be many hands up at all. I'm, that's my assumption. I may be wrong. And Christadelphians often hesitate when that question is asked. We, we naturally shrink back from a, a definite answer on that. And maybe we have good reasons for that. It's probably thought that to answer that question in a positive way, in the affirmative, is, is almost presumptuous in a sense, or uh, it sort of hints of arrogance even to say, yes, I, th I believe, I, I'm confident, I, ha I anticipate that I'll be in the kingdom, almost uh, has, a, has an arrogance to it. And on the other side of the coin, to, to hesitate and to say, I don't know, and I'll leave it to the judge or through God's grace I might receive acceptance sort of um, has a sense of humility and meekness about it. I want to question that, I suppose, um, position a little bit in our exhortation this morning. Is the reason that it's presumptuous to say, yes, I will be in the kingdom or to see it as arrogant because we rely or we see that acceptance at the judgment seat then relies too much upon ourselves and they, therefore it would be if that was our view then to say yes I will be in the kingdom is then or does have a sense of, of arrogance about it. So this morning we want to think about that question can we actually know? Let's think about that word know for a minute. To know. There are many scriptures that talk about the idea of knowing. We, we haven't got time this morning to look at all of them but I'll just bring a few to mind and we'll look a few up. Uh, a classic one, an Old Testament one to start with from Job, Job 19, where Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand upon the earth, and in my, you know, my flesh I will, I will receive this redemption. Notice he says, my Redeemer. He doesn't, doesn't say, the Redeemer lives, because we all, we all would agree with that quite easily. Of course the Redeemer lives. But he says, my Redeemer lives, and I will receive redemption, implied, of course, in those words. Um, there's Job's faith. I mean, there's, there's New Testament examples. We've got a 1 John one. We might look at 1 John 5. It's just an interesting little context here. First John 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe. So it, it, the, the, the structure here, the, the syntax here starts with belief, with, with faith. So I'm writing to you who believe or have faith on the name of the Son of God that. Okay, so you have faith already. And I'm writing to you that. This is the objective. That ye may know. Oida here in the group, that you might know that you have eternal life and that, so there's a sort of a secondary sort of clause here in this, in this syntax, that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. I'm reading from the, the authorised version. I know ESV and others have it slightly different, but, but if we just follow the structure here. You believe, that's the, that's the start of the process. You believe, and I'm writing to you who have faith, that you might know you have eternal life, that you might have faith. It's sort of like a, there's a cycle built into that word, isn't it? into that little structure there. Our faith is strengthened. Of course, we start with faith, but our faith is strengthened by this proposition here in the middle that we have eternal life, that there's a sense of confidence. And in the context here, we haven't got time to flesh it out, but Verse 14 talks about this confidence and verse 15 mentions the word know again twice. We know, know. We have confidence and we know that we are in the, the realm of God's love. We are recipients of God's care and God's love. And the confidence of that knowledge compels us in our faith. And, and that is what we want to sort of think about a little bit this morning. 
We haven't got time to look up all the passages I'd like to go to this morning because the exhortation, of course, is a bit shorter, but I'm sure most of us know the basic outline of Psalm 42, where we, those famous words, why, why, is my, why art thou um, cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? It's got, it's got a sense of, um, of spiritual depression, in a sense, built into, the, into those words, and it repeats itself through that psalm. And, and that's a, a question that's raised by the psalmist. And his answer, and we'll come back to this answer in a minute, the answer is hope in God. And it repeats itself through that psalm, hope in God. So just keep that little phrase in your mind, hope in God, and we'll, we'll come back to that concept. And this, this is going to be the key in our, in our discussion this morning, this idea of hoping and placing our hope in God for an answer to that question rather than a reliance on ourselves. So, so hope really is the answer to this particular question. Hope is, as it was for Job, it was the assurance that his Redeemer would, would cause him to stand again. It's behind the words here in 1 John 5 of knowing that, that we have eternal life. Um, and it's the antidote to spiritual depression, as we see there in, um, in, in that psalm, in Psalm 42. Now, you might be saying, well, hope, we've heard the word hope used before, and we use the word ourselves in our prayer, in our conversation, our discussions. Hope doesn't really answer that question for me. It, it, it doesn't seem to be as um, affirmative as, as you're making it out. And I would suggest that's because we are not using the word hope correctly when we think about it, when we use it in our language. I'm suggesting that we use an English version of the word hope, and not the biblical or the Greek version of that word hope when we use it. And I want to explain a little bit about that this morning. In English, the word hope implies a sense of, of desire or even, even wishing for something. I hope for something or I wish that it might happen. That's, how, that's, where we, that's the meaning we normally gravitate to when we read verses in the Bible that talk about hope. The saints should have hope or believers should have hope. It's like a, a wish or a desire, and that's because that's how we use it in English. We might say, for example, a uh, little boy might say, I hope daddy comes home early enough so we can kick the ball around before, before it's dark. He's got a hope or a desire that daddy's going to come home a bit earlier. But he, has no, no, he doesn't know if that's going to be the case. It might be, it might not. He has no power over that. And he won't know the answer to that hope until the car turns up on the driveway. It's just, it's just a wish. Or we might say, I hope it doesn't rain Saturday because I'm getting married. So I hope it doesn't rain on the weekend. Again, we, we won't know the answer to that hope until Saturday morning when, when, the, when it all happens. So it's a wish, it's a desire. And I think sometimes we bring that superimposed meaning of hope and apply it to the biblical idea of hope. And this morning we'll see it is, in fact, almost the dead opposite to that. I hope, you know, Bill and Mary are at the combined weekend and I can catch up with them. And you won't know until the combined weekend comes. I hope the traffic's okay on the way to the meeting or else I, I could be late. We won't know until we're on the freeway and, uh, and we see the, the result of the traffic there. Hope, the way we use it in English, is almost like, you know, crossing the fingers and saying, I hope... You know, you're watching a, a sporting event. I hope the ball goes through the posts or whatever. I'm hoping. I, I, I won't know until we see the final result. Well, as I said, amazingly, the Bible concept of hope is significantly different than that. The word hope um, is the Greek word uh, elbis, or we anglicise as elpis, I suppose. It's an interesting word. It's, it's, it's archaic in the sense that it's not the modern Greek word that is used. The modern Greek word for any, any Greeks you might have is elbida, we, which we use now. Um, and elbis is, 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 as I said, archaic and not used. We, we'll have a little look at that word. There is another word used in the New Testament that's more closely related to our idea of hope, which is this wish and desire concept, which is a totally different word altogether. Euhomi is, is the other Greek word. It's used in a couple, won't, won't look them up, but there's a couple of examples just to, just to give you an idea of the, the meaning of that word. Totally different you know, etymology than, than Elbis. Um, remember when um, Paul is in front of Agrippa, and Agrippa says, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. 
And Paul says, I would, I would to God that all men were like, were like me except for these chains. That word, I would, um, is this uomi which has the idea of I wish, I would love to, I desire. That would be fantastic. That's what I hope for in, in the English sense of hope. Okay? It's not the Greek word for hope at all. Another time, is another, it's another Acts example, uh, 26, Paul's in the shipwreck, for example. They, they, they throw all the stuff overboard and they throw out the anchors and it says they, they hunkered down and I think it's they, they wished for the day. Remember that? They wished for the morning, I think it is. They wished for the morning. That, that word wished is that same word. It's, it, it's more closely related to our hope, our desire. Just can't wait for morning to get here. We hope, hope, hope it's morning soon and things calm down and the storm passes. Um, that is not that is not related in any way to the word hope. The biblical word hope, elbiz, means a confident expectation. If you don't believe me, look it up. Okay, look it up in all the normal lexicons and 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 concordances that we as Christadelphians traditionally use. Look it up and see if I'm right or wrong. Look it on your phone if you've got Esau or something. It's what it means. It's very simple to find that out. Strong, I'll read you some, I'll read you more, the more traditional definitions. I've looked at other more modern ones as well, but our traditional ones, let's, let's look at what they say. Strong's Concordance says, Elbis or Elpis means to anticipate with expectation and confidence. Strong's. Thayer's, it comes from a primary root, Elpo, which means to anticipate and implies expectation. Vines has got a really good article on it. In Vines, New Testament, a favourable and confident expectation. It's not my words, that's what the, the Greek experts, the Greek authorities are saying this word means. A favourable and confident expectation. A confident anticipation of a favourable outcome is how we might think of that word. There is an interesting usage just to try and illustrate it where in Philippi, remember there was that um, a damsel that had that spirit of divination and Paul heals her and the, the, her masters get very upset because he had uh, dashed there, it says in the King James, their hope of gain. They, they strongly anticipated that they would make a lot of money. That's why they're so angry. If it was just a wish, that wouldn't have been as angry. But they knew, they had a, they had a confident anticipation that this, this girl would generate a lot of money for them. So that, they had that expectation and Paul, Paul dashed that by healing her. So, if this is correct... Um, if, if, I, if I was to say, let's say my question was different, I said, put your hand up if you, if you have a hope to be in the kingdom. Everyone would put their hand up. We all have a hope to be in the kingdom. That's, what, it's, that's the very core of our, of our faith. We all hope to be in the kingdom. Okay, put your hand up if you've got a hope. Everyone would put their hand up. Put your hand up if you believe we should have a hope to be in the kingdom. Put our hand up again. Yes, of course we believe we should have a hope. We believe it's an imperative. It's there in scripture. Faith, hope and love are that trio of characteristics that run through the New Testament. It's, 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 we're sa Romans 8 says we are saved by hope. It's essential to have hope. Then why could we not put our hands up when the question is asked, do we expect, do we have confident anticipation to be in the kingdom? This is interesting. Think, just, I'm, I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. Think about, just go through that, that logic again. If we should have hope, it's an imperative to have hope. If hope really means a confident anticipation of being in the kingdom, then, and if biblically they are the same thing, why do we hesitate to say I have a confident anticipation of being in the kingdom, but I, I, I hesitate to answer that one, but I can answer that we should have hope. Just, I just want us to think about, am I wrong there? Am I wrong? And, and if I am, please say something to me afterwards because I'm, I'm a big boy, I can take it, and, and, and I'd like to know, but from the context of the word hope in the New Testament, from the technical etymology and the meaning of the word, that's what it seems to say to me, that believers should have hope, should have a confident anticipation of being in the kingdom. And I don't want to get judgy, but if you don't, then are you not obeying scripture? If scripture says we should have hope, if hope is technically a confident anticipation of being the kingdom, and we don't have a confident anticipation of being the kingdom, then are we not quite in alignment with the New Testament spirit and attitude? 
Now, even though I've said hope is a confident anticipation and expectation of a favourable outcome, it's not a mathematical certainty either. It's not a scientific type of absoluteness built into that word of like one plus one equals definitely equals two. But on the, on the spectrum, the, under, the word is far closer to that end of the spectrum than it is to the wish and desire usage that we often apply to it, much more closer to that end. I'll try and give you an example of how hope, this, the, 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 the actual definition of obese really is. I'll give you an example. I have a hope to stay married to Susan for the rest of our life or until the Lord returns. I've, I hope that. Biblically speaking, I anticipate that with, with, a, with a high level of, of confidence. I don't wake up every morning going, yes, we're still married. <laughs> or just like, I hope I can milk another year or two out of this thing. I, I, that's, not, that's, not, that's not how I see hope. And it doesn't mean I'm a perfect husband at all. I'm far, far, far from it. If you can, she'll account for that later on if you need any testimony to that. Or even a, even a good husband. I've got flaws and problems and, and, and annoying habits, whatever. So I'm not saying that's the basis of my hope is not me. But there's a commitment there, isn't there? There's a relationship there. There's, there's, there's objectives to, that we both have. So we've got this, based on a relationship, I have this confident anticipation it doesn't, it's not based on my perfect performance, it's not based on me getting everything right and all my decisions right, and it's not based on my perfect behaviour in that relationship, and it's not based on, uh, on ch you know, random change on an hour or day-by-day -day basis. It's, it's, a, it's a confident anticipation which, which sort of captures that word. It's not absolute, it's not scientifically absolute. We could, either of us could have a mental breakdown or a catastrophe could come into our life that that changes things. Who, who knows? We don't know what the future holds. But, but all things being equal, and I have a very strong, confident anticipation that we will remain married for the, for the rest of our lives or until the Lord returns. And the same is with God. We have a relationship with him. That chesed we looked at yesterday, the chesed of Yahweh. We are connected to him. There are obligations from a faithful God as well uh, to us. And... and, uh, and, and uh, it's not absolute that I will be absolutely in the kingdom. I, they're, they're, again, a mental breakdown, a, a brain snap, things, things happen in life. But I have in my life a confident anticipation of salvation. And I believe that is the attitude of the first century, the, the spirit that runs through the first century believers. To finish up, I just want to look at a couple of phrases that are coupled with the word faith, with obese in the... In the, in the um, in, in the New Testament. One's in Hebrews 6 that we read this morning. Let's have a look here. And again, the juxtaposition of these words with hope is, is really powerful, I think. So let's have a look at a few of these words just to finish up. And a little, and a little bit of the context. Verse 11 of Hebrews 6. We desire that every one of you shows the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. So just look at this word, this phrase actually, full assurance linked here with hope. Full assurance of elbis, of hope. This word full assurance gives us some insight into, and its linkage here with hope, gives us some insight into the attitude that the writer of the Hebrews is expressing. The full assurance. The Greek word is pleroforia. Plero is the idea of fullness, being full, and, and phoria has this idea of, of, of weight, full weight. And I think the uh, translators here have really nailed it. With, it's, it's the idea of full assurance. When you, when you research the etymology of the word, the, there's, a, there's a metaphor built into this word. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, the word picture in this word is a ship, a massive ship when it sails absolutely full of wind and being thrust along the ocean absolutely full weight, you know, the, the sails are bearing the full weight of the wind and they're being propelled, or the ship is being propelled in that sense. One, one commentator says a vehement inclination and propulsion that comes from uh, the, the full sails in, the, in a gale. So the full, the full sails are bursting in a gale and the ship's being propelled along. 
That's, that's the, the metaphor building this phrase. So let's put it together with hope. We can have a full assurance, pleroforia, this full assurance of, of hope, of confident anticipation to the end. And it's linked also to another word which we won't explore, the idea of euphoria in a sense, a, a, a full feeling, you know, this feeling of, 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 of well-being, if you like. And so these things are all connected together. There's an emotional connection here by having this full assurance, this pleurothoria, the euphoria, the feeling, the, the, the hope, the anticipation, all sort of work together here. There's another word, plethora, which is also connected here in, 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 this, in this usage. Notice it then is the motivating power for a response in this verse. The writer says, I, wa I want you to have this diligence. And he says, therefore, in verse 12, don't be slothful. You know, diligent and slothful, the little pair that runs through Proverbs, for example, diligent to this, slothful to that. What's the motivation for being diligent instead of slothful? Is it fear? Is it the stick? Is it the result of being slothful? He says, no, it's full assurance. If you've got full assurance, plethoria, and confidence, that is the driving force. That is the wind in your sails. That's the propulsion engine, if you like. That's, that's the motivation in your life to overcome slothfulness and show, show diligence. And this, is, this has got to be the thing, you know. I, I just read a book recently. Um, it was, a, it was like the history of, of different religions and, and, it, and it was a chapter on Christianity and I, I just read it and I was just very moved by the writer saying that when these early believers, when they heard the gospel, it, it, they, it like they discovered the secret of the universe. It was like this incredible thing that they, they'd unlocked and, and it filled them with joy and it filled them with peace and all these, th all these New Testament terms, so much so that they would sing hymns when they were... When, you know, when Nero sent them into the, lion, into the arena to be eaten by lions with their families, they'd go in there and be singing hymns. They had this incredible hope, this plerothoria of assurance that, that they could face a lion and be ripped to shreds that uh, sort of was real. You know, that, that was, that's, the, that's the spirit that runs through, for me, the New Testament and the use of that, that word hope in its, in, its, in its proper context. Look, let's look at Romans 4. There's another little interesting... Uh, usage of, of hope in this very famous chapter, of course, Romans 4, all about the faith of, and the hope of Abraham. And again, we're out of, we're out of time to really f spend a lot of time on it, but I'm just going to pick out the salient points really quickly as we, we move through it. But um, we've got the context in the start of chapter 4, quoting from Psalm 32 about uh, let's look at verse 7. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven. So here, here's, a, here's the, sort of the, the context here. The iniquities are forgiven. Your sins are covered. The blessedness, in verse 8, of a man who the Lord does not impute sin. You know, justified, righteous. Okay, this is, this is the context. How, do, how does that happen? How do you get into that state? Then if you just run your eyes down to, say, verse uh, 16. He, he, he uses the example of Abraham. And demonstrates that it was by faith. Verse 16, that it is of faith that it might be by grace. Okay, this is, the, this is the power of salvation that runs through grace and faith. Applied here to the faith of Abraham, who in a sense then, because we are saved by faith as well, he becomes the father of us all. Have a look, just run your eyes down to verse 21. Oh, actually, there's, there's the, the use of... Um, the use of hope um, is very powerful here too in verse 18. Sorry, we'll just, just pick up um, the... Uh, well, verse 18 is the phrase, but I'm sure most of you know the context. He says in verse 18, who against hope believed in hope. So it seemed like it was something that you couldn't have confident anticipation of. You're 100 years old and... You want, to have, you want to have a baby with a wife who was of a similar age, it, it's something you would not naturally have a confident anticipation of. It was, it was impossible. You would have no confident anticipation. It's against hope, if that makes sense. Against hope, against the, the reality, the physical reality, he has hope. He has a confident anticipation based on belief, based on faith that he was going to have a child. 
And he, st he staggers not at the promise of God. And notice that his hope wasn't based on his ability to achieve that result. It was, in fact, the dead opposite. He was, he was past age. Uh, Sarah was well, was well past age as well. So it wasn't, his hope wasn't on me. He wasn't being presumptuous. He wasn't being arrogant to have this hope. It was impossible to have this hope. But he hoped against hope, against the physical reality. It wasn't a reliance on himself. He hoped on God, you see. That's Psalm 42, isn't it? That, that idea of hope in God. And verse 21, here's our word in the context of hope. Being fully persuaded, pleroforia, the, the, the wind in the, in the sails propelled him, fully persuaded that Abraham was able to achieve this. No, it doesn't say that. That God, the one who promised, was able to perform it. And then verse 23 says, this wasn't written for Abraham's sake. It wasn't written originally in Genesis for Abraham's sake. Nor is Paul writing it here in Romans for Abraham's sake. Abraham's well and truly dead. This is written for us. Therefore it was imputed to him, that belief and that persuasion, that assurance, as Hebrews is translated, that assurance was imputed to him for righteousness. That wasn't written to his sake only, but... For our sakes as well, verse 24, to us also. Now, what's the objective of our hope? We don't hope to have children when we're 100, do we? That's not what we're hoping for. What's the, what's the object of our hope? It's not to have a, a body that, that in this dispensation we don't even hope to have a, an effectual functioning body. We, we, we're subject to the vanity of, of, uh, of, the, of the fall and all the, all the, all the consequences of that. So our hope's not in a, in a physical thing. What's our hope? It's got to be, we've got to have the same assurance, though, the same persuasion and assurance that Abraham has in hope. But what's the objective of the hope? Read on. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe what? Believe that we're going to have children in 100? No. If we have faith on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification to make us righteous. Our hope is against hope, just like Abraham's was. It wasn't based on Abraham, it's not based on us. Our hope is on the one who promised and is able, powerful to perform. That's why we can put our hand up and say, I have hope, I believe, I'm confidently um, anticipating the kingdom and, and my place in the kingdom, not because of me, because of him who promised. And that's the power of it. Just two more, Second Thessalonians 2, just to pick up a few other phrases associated with hope. Second Thessalonians 2, an appeal not to follow the, the apostasy, of course, and, and, uh, and to stay firm to the end. Let's go to the end of that, of that chapter. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now let's just pick it up for time's sake. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's, you know, that's incredible words we can't dwell on. But therefore, verse 15, therefore, when you say that word therefore, you know, you, you, you're following, you're following a, a deduction here, a conclusion. Therefore, brethren, stand firm, hold fast the traditions that you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. And what's the motiv motivating power to do that? Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. It's like it's like this emphasis in those words. Jesus Christ himself is promising this. And God our Father. You know, there's this, this emphasis on the importance of this, this statement. It's coming from Jesus himself and God our Father who has loved us and hath... And this is in the present tense. Okay, get this into our minds. This is now. Has in the present tense given us Everlasting consolation. Here's another little phrase associated with hope. And a good hope through grace. Everlasting consolation. This is a really interesting phrase. 
Strong's has that word uh, definition as perpetual, perpetual, everlasting, perpetual. Consolation is a word we're familiar with parakletos, which we, we often translate as exhortation or to uplift. We've got, we've got this perpetual upliftedness. That's not a technical term, by the way. Um, I'm trying to think of a better way to say that. A perpetual um, emotional power that comes from the reality of this position we're in. Perpetual comfort, perpetual exhortation. You know, I, I'd never heard many exhorts on that phrase before. For some reason, I've never gravitated to that. In, why not? Why, why aren't we focusing on that? We have perpetual exhortation, perpetual comfort based on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father has done this for us. And good hope, and notice the end of that verse, through grace. It always comes back to this, doesn't it? This unmerited divine favour. Then verse 17 says, comfort, that's parakletos again. So we have perpetual Perpetual parakletos, perpetual comfort through the gospel. Perpetual comfort. Pleroforia, euphoria. Look, put all these phrases together. It's telling a story, isn't it? The result, comfort your hearts. Reminds us of the, one of the verses we looked at earlier on, in First Thessalonians 4. You know, when you're at the graveside of a loved one, comfort, comfort yourselves with these words. Don't, we don't sorrow as others. There's an emotional difference in our sorrow and comfort yourselves by these words. Now, it says, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Again, what is the motivation to good works? Is it the stick? Is it fear? That's not what these verses are leading us to believe. The motivation to every good word and every good work is coming from this perpetual comfort in our hearts, this everlasting consolation through good hope. Hopefully that, 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 the power of that is, is coming through. And let's just finish up in 1 Peter 1, just to, to refocus on our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice this morning. 1 Peter 1. context here is redemption. We've been redeemed. The precious blood of the Lord. Verse 21. Let's just pick it up there. Who by him do believe. There's faith in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Okay, this is, this is the motive. This is, the, this is where the, the basis of our hope is. God, the power is in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and your confident anticipation is in God. Not in yourself, as Psalm 42 says, hope in God. Your faith and your hope, your confident anticipation of a favourable outcome is in God. And, and, and the power of that is based on the precious blood of Christ as we get to in verse nine, as we go back to verse 19. The precious blood of Christ. And we remember that, of course, in the emblems this morning. So, brothers and sisters, I am going to put my hand up. And I'm, and I'm doing this now to say I have a confident anticipation of being in the kingdom. And I can assure you it's not because of me. Please believe, I'm not just being falsely humble here at all. If you knew the stupid things that go through my mind, you would not have invited me here, I can assure you. You would not even probably fellowship me. I, I can assure you of that. It's not confidence on me at all, any way, shape or form. My hope, my confident anticipation is represented there in the precious blood of Christ. And my hope, my confident anticipation is in God. Thank you.